for the uh, technical difficulties, which is really ironic because I work in like technology. Um, so once again, my name is Eric, and uh, thank you guys for sticking around and uh, being here today. Uh, I'm a fifth year, soon to be sixth year graduate student. Yes, I'm pretty old, uh, and I'm here to talk to you about some physics, and I really like materials physics, so I thought I'd share a little bit about what we do and why we care about what we do. Uh, namely, that's how do we get fuel from sunlight. So, here's a graph. I like graphs. You'll learn that a lot of physicists like graphs. Um, this is a chart that shows the world's energy consumption. On the y-axis here, I have energy, which is measured in many, many terawatts per year as a function of time on the x-axis. And you can see that the general trend is upward meaning that people are using more and more and more energy every year and it is something that we have to address because we are rapidly running out of renewable resources, non-renewable. So uh, let's think about it. What is one source of energy that is there 24-7, uh, 365 days of the year? Sun. The sun and geothermal, but we're going to be talking about the sun. Um, the sun is there every day and uh, physicists also like numbers, so I'll give you some numbers here. Uh, let's look at how much power we use, 16 terawatts. So a terawatt is one many, many zeros watts. Uh, 36, 9, 12 watts, uh, 10 to the 12. So we use this much power every year, uh, or instantaneously. Now, look at the sun, how much power the sun gives us. The sun gives us, uh, not to uh, put any hurt on Tyler and his gut bacteria, but we have way more powers from the sun than there are gut microbes in your gut. So that's 174,000 trillion watts of power that the sun can deliver. So uh, here's another comparison. This number of watts that the sun provides could power New Haven 100 million times over. It's a lot of power. Uh, so my question is, since we receive 10,000 times more energy than we use, how can we efficiently harness this energy? So what I uh, want to do is to look at ways we can collect this energy. You guys might have heard of solar panels, which is a way to convert uh, uh, solar energy into electricity. I'd like to talk about a second way you can get sunlight to do interesting and useful work, uh, namely to get sunlight to behave like a fuel, to collect the sunlight so that you can use that power, move from point A to point B, instead of a solar panel, which once the sun is gone, there is no more power. So we'll be talking about that. And uh, since I'm a physicist, I like equations, so I'm going to give you guys a really simple equation that tells you exactly how this works, and it's right here. <laughs> so, uh, as you can see here, actually, no, it's a little easier than this. Actually, this is the equation I want to give you. This is the equation. Sunlight plus water gives you fuel. So uh, if there's one takeaway message I want you guys to leave here, it's this equation. Uh, you can take sunlight, you add some stuff to it, water, fuel and I'm gonna explain or try to convince you that I'm not lying. And the secret is a material that we're gonna to use to kind of combine this and make it make the whole process work. So, first of all, before I talk about that, I have to explain what materials physics is, because I'm a materials physicist. Um, so we, as materials physicists, use physics, which is the thing that describes how matter works and nature works, uh, and we use it to apply to technology to develop new types of engineering technologies. Uh, we are interested in having applications in electronics and biotech, space science, you might have heard all the cool things SpaceX has been doing. Uh, of course, energy research is something that a lot of people are interested in for the reasons I uh, enumerated earlier. And it's also a very multidisciplinary science. It's really important to point out here that it really is all of these things. And sometimes we physicists like to hate on the soft sciences, but we really we care about everybody. It's, it's not just physicists. Um, and uh, to explain this, I'd like to give you one uh, introduction to one concept, and that's called the photoelectric effect. And this is an effect that was kind of discovered by Albert Einstein. Do you guys know who Albert Einstein is? No. Yes. He's a, some smart dude who did some physics, that's right. Okay, so the photoelectric effect is this. It turns out that if you uh, take light, which is made up of little particles called photons, and then you, uh, you, you shoot them at a uh, material like a metal, the photons can excite the electrons in the metal, and that's what the photoelectric effect is. But it's not exactly that black and white. It determines if the conditions are right. What do I mean by that? So every material has this property, and it's called a band gap. 
And I want you to visualize this band gap like a hill. So here, imagine you have a really large hill. We consider that a material with a very large band gap. And now imagine you have a bowling ball that you're trying to roll up the hill. So what the sun is going to do is the sun's photons are going to kick that bowling ball up the hill. But if this is a really, really big hill, the bowling ball is going to go up halfway, and then it's going to fall back down because it's too big of a hill. But if you can imagine if the hill were much smaller, for example, let's look at this over here. We have a little small band gap here. If the sun sends the same photons here, it's going to kick that bowling ball and it'll fly right away. So in this sense, a real material system, this is a slightly more complicated version, uh, but has the same physics here, is that if you have a material with different band gap sizes, you can, uh, you can figure out which ones will have the uh, bowling ball move across the hill, namely if it's smaller or versus larger. And what's actually happening is the photons from the sun are coming in, and these electrons are actually being kicked out of the material, as pictured over here, where they can move to light your light bulb, power your iPhone, allow you to capture that Pikachu, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. All right, so um, how does this relate to what we do, and what, how are we doing this at Yale? Well, what I like to do is, in my lab, we actually grow materials. Uh, certain materials called perovskite oxides. Everyone repeat after me, perovskite oxides. Perovskite oxides. I'm so glad I hear a class full of high schoolers saying that word. Anyway, so this is just a fancy way of saying any kind of material with the form ABO3, where A and B are elements in the periodic table, O is an oxygen atom. And an example of a perovskite looks like this. It looks kind of like a cube, and it has different elements in it. Anyway, it turns out that certain of these perovskite materials, when you put them together, you can uh, engineer or control the band gap sizes and how they're lined up in a material. So you effectively can control the energy landscape, which allows these electrons to move back and forth when you hit them with photons. So that's something that we work on. And we use fancy machines, uh, I think Diane was talking about in the intro. Uh, this is an example, my laser pointer is not working, but that's actually the chamber that I work in. And it's big complicated machinery where we actually grow these perovskite oxides, which I picture over here. So. Um, here are some actual pictures of atoms. So one other thing that we materials physicists like doing is actually looking at things really, really closely. So these are actually individual atoms that you can image with an electron microscope. And the idea here is that we can take two very, very different materials. This is like a piece of glass. This is a chip of silicon. Silicon like the silicon that you find in your phones and your uh, computers. And we're able to put these two things together with atomic precision. Uh, here's another example where you have two materials where you look at the atomic level and you see almost no, nothing at the interface. So we're able to control when we make these materials with that fine of an accuracy, which is really needed if you want to really control how the material behaves. You want it to be conducting, you want it to be insulating, you want it to be uh, thermally uh, power, uh, high thermal power, low thermal power, a lot of different properties. They manifest from how well you grow the material. So that's another takeaway point. Okay, so I've been talking a lot about these oxides. You might be getting bored of me, but it turns out that these oxide materials are kind of everywhere. So uh, from, I, I was alluding to, if you zoom in on your, uh, your smartphones and you break it open, you look in the CPU of a computer, you'll find that all of them have something called a transistor. A transistor is kind of the core of every piece of modern technology. And in the middle of a transistor is an oxide. It's called high K oxide. So, Oxides are there. Oxides are in uh, new types of transistor technology to, to make like a instant on-off computers. Uh, you may have heard about the phenomenon of superconductivity, which is when there's no resistance in wires to make maglev uh, high-speed flotation uh, trains. Uh, even in the catalytic converters of your car, there are different oxides at work trying to remove the, the toxic gases from your uh, combustion engine so we don't pollute the atmosphere. And uh, of course, solar panels are full of oxides, even though you might not see them. So these things are really prevalent. Um, okay, so I've, uh, I want to just conclude with one thing here. Uh, science is really a collaborative effort. And it's not just in material science where I try to sell that we're really collaborative. It's in every, no matter if you're doing biology, chemistry, uh, psychology, uh, physics, science, engineering, they're all hugely collaborative efforts, meaning that no one can do this him or herself. So it really requires a whole team, a whole globe of scholars and scientists in order to tackle a problem and to solve it. So I would not be able to do that alone. I would not even be able to do it with these four people who are people I work with very closely. It takes many, many schools, many countries to work together in order to kind of advance the site. So that, uh, that's the note I want to end on. If you want to know more about how I actually make these oxides, please come uh, talk to me afterward, or you can send me an email. This is my email address, eric.jen at Yale. Uh, I look forward to talking to you guys. Thank you.